Cool. Welcome to today's lectures, guys. If you're watching on YouTube and Facebook, you're getting a behind the scenes lecture from an in person training we did. But today, we're going to be talking about how to become your higher self and operate from that version of you who is the 2.0 version. So, first, I want to start just by asking you guys when I talk about a 2.0 version of you, what are some things that come to mind? Let's go this way, Numer. What are your thoughts? It's all about the subtraction to me. Where mm -hmm. We all start with the shining light within us, and mm -hmm. societal and environmental factors take dull that shining light. Mm -hmm. And so, to me, 2.0 is all about going back and subtracting all right. those negative social and environmental factors. Okay. So really letting go of the conditioning from the environment, from the society, and almost coming back to that childlike curiosity when it comes to exploring the world. Yeah, so to give a quick example, I remember as a child, it was, I had endless belief in myself, like, mm -hmm. this needs to be done, of course I'll do this. Right. And somewhere along the way, things changed to, this needs to be done, oh, I clearly can't do this, and now I have to put an effort to show myself I can do it. Right. So 2.0 is all about reverting back to that joy and self-belief in life. Okay. What about you, Lloyd? <coughs> For me, 2.0 of me is about finding fulfillment and happiness always from me first. Mm -hmm. And having that lifelong, instead of how I used to live my life, which is finding mm -hmm. happiness and fulfillment from others, whether it was my ex-wife, or my job, mm -hmm. or friends. Um, I want my fulfillment and happiness to come from within me. And I want to be aware of my cravings so that Fulfill my happiness. I don't. I, I achieve happiness not from external. I want, if it's women, friends, family, I want them to complement to my happiness, not a dependency for my happiness. Where it was, that's how it was for me, and I don't want to become dependent, which I'm told up all the time. Right. So finding that joy and peace and happiness from within is what that looks like for you. Yes, and then learning how to bring uh, the right people in to complement that. Mm -hmm. What about you? Uh, for me, it's uh, also uh, refinding curiosity. Mm -hmm. Not even refinding. Uh, knowing, uh, developing curiosity, mm -hmm. but not like trying to do anything. Just finding the curiosity that I already have when it comes to uh, my relationships with people and mm -hmm. how I approach the world whether that be in uh, stuff that I want to do, mm -hmm. people that I want to meet, or how I talk to people, mm -hmm. um, how I consume stuff, mm -hmm. uh, like even how I eat food. Right. Um, rather than uh, having some layers of like cycles of like cravings and then resentment about that, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. so one specific thing would be um, I want to, uh, in this trip, for example, uh, discover what it's like to uh, <coughs> uh, basically how my conversations with girls or with other people could go. Right. Um, if I'm, you know, fully relaxed and not really trying to do anything. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, you know, not trying to get to an end goal. Right. So there's a very specific reason I asked you guys this question. When we think about a higher version of who we want to be, we see things from a linear perspective. We feel like there's this end goal we're going to get to, and when we get to that end goal, those are the times where we'll be like, okay, now I'm in my higher self. And part of the reason for that is when you come into the world, the first thing you see is time and space. 
That is the first conception you learn. People talk about the future, you see things happening in the future, you remember your past, but actually the things that you remember and the things that you project, they're all a part of the present moment. And you shift memories from your past with your own interpretation of today. So we look at this higher version of us and who we want to be as a point in the future, but instead what you want to do to really create this today, right now, is to ask yourself, what is the perspective I would see the world from if I was that higher self? What are the lenses I would put into my reality so that just like a contact lens, when I don't have it, I can't see anything. You can put a contact lens of what you want to see in the world so that the world looks to you very differently than it does to other people. So an example of this is, you know, when military veterans come back from war, they have trouble going to the grocery store and buying some cereal because what they see is like, oh my God, there's danger. What if something comes from the corner because they have all these perceptions of what could happen based on previous experiences that they have gone through. So the question is, how can we get to that higher self today so that the perspective we see our life in is from that higher self? And this is where, apart from the meditation, the six R's come in very handy. Because when you look at your problems with life and with woman, it all comes down to the five hindrances in the Buddhist teachings. And we can apply this specifically to woman. So the five hindrances, first one is doubt. So you don't know if something will go. You don't know if you're doing something right, which is a very common thing people say. Oh, am I six houring correctly? Am I going through the steps as I should be doing them? So doubt, when it comes to meeting woman, is you overthinking. Oh, is she going to respond the way I want her to respond? Am I approaching with the right tonality? Am I approaching with the right body? Am I relaxed enough? Am I expressive? All of these questions. If you're on the path, if you're working on this, just trust that you're doing the best you can in this moment. And everything else that comes up is doubt. It's a hindrance. So you let go of that hindrance. And I'll talk about how to do that in just a bit. The second type of hindrance is sensual desire. It's interesting because a lot of people come into this journey because of the hindrance of sensual desire. You want to have experiences with women. You want to know what it feels like to be on a date with an attractive girl and how it feels when her face is right there and what that experience looks like. You want to know how it feels to kiss a girl, to go on a date, to enjoy your time, to move things further. And part of that desire is biology just expressing itself. But a lot of the sensual desire, what's interesting is we're more, we crave more the idea of what something means to us than actually getting that idea. The attractive girl means something to us. So we're like, oh, once I get this, this is the things that will mean about me. Finally, I'm an attractive guy. Finally, I can get the type of woman I want. Whereas there is nothing to really crave from an attractive girl. And you can let go of that sensual desire. So sure, you can still be inspired to talk to a girl but know the difference between you see a girl who is just like very, with a very sexually charged energy walking down the street, knows that she's hot, but you know she's going to ruin your life long term. <laughs> you want to know how to let go of that sensual desire and understand, yes, I see her body, I see the way she walks, I see those tattoos in the back, but this is not what I want right now and that sensual desire. The third type of hindrance is ill will and hatred. So you'll see this a lot in the red pill community. And they'll be like, oh, hypergamy doesn't care, bro. <laughs> Even if you get her, she's gonna cheat on you when the high value guy appears. Or, oh, what we were talking about the podcast yesterday, 
oh, if a girl acts out, she doesn't text back in two hours, you need to put her into her place, man. It's all ill will and hatred. Or even when you see a guy who gets results with women that you want to get, if there is resentment, if there is certain emotions where you're like, oh, how can this guy get the type of guy, girl that I want? I'm so much better than this guy. That's ill will and hatred. And the more you can be happy for other people's results, the easier it will be for you to get the results that you want, whether that's with fitness, with business, with dating, anything because you're letting go of that ill will and hatred. The fourth type of hindrance is sloth and torpor, which is when you just feel like you're a bit burnt out, you're tired. And this happens mainly when you try an approach to meeting woman that is not sustainable long term. So if you've ever been the guy or met the guy, who approaches 30 women one day and does this for like two weeks straight and then the next three months doesn't do anything because now he's burnt out. Or another example of this is guys will join a certain coaching program or do a certain boot camp and they'll do a lot of like approaching, approaching, approaching and they'll come from a very technical perspective but then throughout the process they lose touch with why they got there in the first place. So then they're like, oh, I'm going to take a break from dating. And that can happen when maybe a guy's been swiping on apps a lot. And then he gets some matches, gets some dates, but dates are not with the type of woman that he wants to be around. So then he's like, oh, I don't, I'm deleting these apps. Dating doesn't work in 2022. All these women, I'm not interested in anyways. I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to just focus on my pri myself, my purpose, and not care about women, which is also a defense mechanism in itself. It's giving into that burnout. And it can also, this sloth and torpor can come up in different ways as well. Maybe you are drinking a coffee and you're energized, but the moment you see that attractive girl, you go, ah, oh, I'm, I'm just a bit too tired today. I'll approach the next one. But really, it's sloth and torpor. That's not you. You let go of that hindrance and you go talk to her anyway. The last one, hindrance number five, is restlessness. And this will speak to a lot of guys. If you cannot have a coffee with your friend, without frantically looking around for a girl to go and talk to, that's restlessness. So of course, you want to be with your mind open to opportunities, but you also want to be enjoying what you're experiencing in the present moment. So don't give in to the temptation that, oh, if I listen to my friend fully for a few seconds, there might be a girl walking from there and I will miss out. Or if you're on a date and all you can think about is, I'm going to take her back, baby. And you can't pay attention to what she's speaking about. You can't pay attention to the things that she's sharing. You can't pay attention to the beauty of the present moment. That's restlessness. That desire to, oh, Hopefully she can finish speaking so I can talk about how cool I am. That's restlessness. You have a question? Uh, I have more of a comment, but like an example of that. Right. Just now. Go ahead. So I just had that just now where I was talking to a girl and I realized that I felt restlessness because she was telling me about this post Christmas holiday and we were just talking about that. Right. How they have like a birthday or Christmas or something, New Year's, like every single day. Yeah. For like two weeks. And I was just thinking about, okay, what's the next thing I'm going to say so that I can get her number? Right. Which I got, but it, w it wasn't enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And also I could tell that she knew that as well. Right. Yeah. yeah, when you have hindrances arise, if you don't let go of them, they will take over. And they will come with their friends. 
So first you experience restlessness. You're like, what do I say? And then you're like, oh, if I say this and get her number and then I take her out and then we can have some good times. <laughs> so sensual desire. And then you're like, oh, but what if she does this? And then there's doubt. So all the hindrances, when they come, they bring their friends. So what you want to do is you 6R when the hindrances arise. Yeah? So we're all logical guys. So question right. now is why are these hindrances specifically in the dating context? So these hindrances can appear in any context. The examples are just in the dating context. I understand. And what I'm asking is why is doubt a problem when it comes to dating? Why is sensual desire a problem when it comes to like, right. um, we call them hindrances, but I would like us to dig deeper into why mm. these are hindrances in the first place. Right. The reason these are hindrances is very simple. They take you out of the present moment. And life is in the present moment. And we're going to talk about how to get back to the present moment and what's the process you, you do there. But in order for you to first experience reality from that higher version of yourself, first you need to be present enough so that you can put mental power into altering how reality exists. Because if you're not present enough, then you don't have the brain power to pick what you see. If your mind's running at 100 miles an hour, throwing thoughts left, back, and left, right, and center, then you're just going to be responding or you're going to be reacting to that. Whereas if you can fully be present in the moment, you respond to the situations that arise as they arise. And the biggest problem guys have when it comes to dating is they can't be present with an attractive girl that they have interest in without either living in the past Oh, last time I was talking to a girl like this, this happened and this happened, and that means I'm a failure in this. Or projecting to the future, okay, I get her number now, and then I schedule a date for Monday, and I see her, yeah. <laughs> That's right, baby. That's what I'm going to do. And as you're going into that thought loop, you're feeding that thought loop a lot more. She's talking about something which maybe you were genuinely interested in but you weren't listening, were you? And what do women want? They want a man who can fully understand who they are. And how can you understand them? You can understand them if you are fully present so that you can actually listen. So presence is actually the biggest gift you can give to a woman and to anyone. And that's all they want. Everything else is in the moment if you're present enough to see it. So this is why letting go of these hindrances is extremely important in dating, but also it will open your mind up to different areas of growth in life in ways that you might not expect. So it will have a lot of carryover effects. But for you guys and for those of you watching the channel, you're mainly interested in dating stuff. So I'm trying to use the dating stuff to bait you in to do very meaningful work <laughs> that you wouldn't do otherwise, at least right now. So what do we do when these hindrances arise? Some of you guys, or actually all of you already know this, but let's go through it one more time. Yes? So that breakdown you gave of why the hindrances mm -hmm. uh, part of in our dating life is really helpful. Another question along those lines is we talk about integrating sexual desire into right. who we are and so how do we balance integrating sexual desire with also understanding that it's a hindrance right that's a good question I don't know the full answer to that question okay. what I've been noticing as I meditate more um, is there is not as much sexual desire which is a bit interesting. And you can also like 
differentiate between heavy sensual craving versus well i get along with this girl our energies are in line with each other so you know i feel some desire towards her yeah. now if you get like very very advanced spiritually there is a point where sexual desire disappears but well, if you get there yeah, yeah neither am i and neither is pierre yeah. so it's like you're going to be working with sensual desire for a long time what you want to be careful of is how your actions are led by the sensual desire so as much as you can you want to avoid pursuing girls just because of that sensual desire now that doesn't mean every girl you see must be the type of girl you would marry you might like different women for different reasons but if you know that physical if physical intimacy wasn't on the table i wouldn't be around this girl then that's feeding the hindrance so you want to let go of that as much as you can but if still you know you get caught into that every now and then you also don't want to guilt yourself about what happened you let go in the moment you don't try to change the past so that's the answer i have now um and the other thing is like even let's say there's some physical intimacy that you're having with a woman in the moment if you're getting too caught up into it you can still six are as you're having the experience mm -hmm. and then you can really slow down the sexual experiences you have and then interestingly the girl has more craving than you do which completely switches over the um, the dynamic and it's also a big turn on for most women if you're if you can genuinely stop yourself no matter how turned on you are because then she knows she's around the guy who's fully in control of what he wants to do and that creates a lot of trust because that means if she's uncomfortable with any situation you can stop so if anything if you can let go of the essential desires over time things will fall into place and your sexual experiences will get better until i haven't experienced this but it probably comes to a point where it just disappears but until then you know this is not to say don't do anything just enjoy your experiences but understand that in the end they don't make much of a difference does that answer the question yes and one more question yeah um, so what you said about the more you can be happy for other people the more right. your own results will benefit this is true to me from an empirical justification in that i mm -hmm. tested it for myself and i saw that it was true is there do you have a reason for why this thing that i think everyone who tests this for themselves empirically finds that it holds true but you have an explanation for why this holds true i don't have a scientific explanation but i think people especially women can feel your intentions so if you are a guy who genuinely loves women and you see the best in them then women respond to you very differently than a guy who's like petty and plays games and is just angry no matter what your outside world is so someone could be very attractive on surface but if their beliefs around women are very resentful and there's ill will and hatred then women will feel a bit off around this person a bit guarded even if they're in relationships right so someone could have a boyfriend who's resentful towards women and they're still in a relationship so on the surface level success but there is not as much emotional intimacy there's not as much connection there's not as much love so the reason 
this perspective is very helpful is it doesn't just help you get the number empirical results it also allows you to get depth when you have an experience with a woman which is why you know if you truly embody this and then you go on a date with a girl and you spend a few weeks with a girl she'll be like i've never met a guy like you before or i feel so close to you i've never felt this way before and this is why doing this work is very important because if you are at that stage you also want to move through the world with a lot of responsibility because it's a lot of responsibility for a girl to open up her heart to you and literally hand it over and you have to guard that very carefully which is why as you let go of these hindrances you'll do a better job of that and it's like the universe rewards people who do good for the universe so then you get more of that and then you know what Lloyd's been talking about for the past few weeks people just appear and then you end up meeting them and then you're like how did that happen I don't know but first you need to really take this seriously so that universe can trust you okay if I were to hand this guy over a beautiful woman he would actually do what's not what's best not just for him and not just for the girl but what's best for him for the girl and for the rest of the universe and if you can operate from that place then eventually you get a lot of good karma behind you and then things start happening but then you also let go of that craving the pride of oh now i'm successful oh now i get some girls Oh, uh, now people just start conversations with me. You also want to let go of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, and so do would would it kind of be like saying the more we can let go of these hindrances and learn to be genuinely happy when other people succeed, we're transforming our inner world into this really positive um, loving state and then somehow the external world always ends up being a reflection of our internal world and right. because we've made a very positive internal world things just start happening in the external world in a positive way as well yeah exactly cool so how do we let go of these hindrances we use the six R's Six Rs is a Buddhist practice. It's from the Twim meditation. So if you guys watching this video, you want to know more about this, there's a YouTube channel. I think it's if you search Bante Vimala Ramsey, you'll find the basic Twim instructions. I also urge you guys to, in your own time, watch some of their talks, learn more about this stuff if you're interested in that. But six hours is very simple. It is not a meditation. It is a process of letting go of distractions. So when a distraction arises, you first recognize the distraction. So let's say you're listening to me now and you're like, man, what is this lecture about? I just want to go talk to some girls, bro. When are we going to be done? <laughs> You recognize there's a distraction and then you release that distraction. So that means if the distraction is there, you simply shift your attention somewhere else. You don't resist. You don't try to beat up the distraction. You don't try to pull a Conor McGregor and fight the distraction. You just release very gently. There is no forcing in this process because when you force, you bring craving into the meditation. It's about letting go of craving. Then you relax the tension and tightness in the mind because whenever there is a distraction, your mind tenses up, sometimes slightly. Sometimes, if you have some shadows come up, some traumas come up, a lot, where your perspective becomes very, very different. So you want to let go of that. You relax the mind. Then you re-smile. 
So you put a smile in your eyes, a smile in your mind, a smile on your lips, and a smile on your heart. And you feel that metta, the loving kindness, radiating as much as you can. Some days this will be very, very wholesome. Some days this will feel like you went to the dentist and he told you to smile and you're like, ah, okay, fine. But try your best at that point. Then you return to the object of meditation. So in daily life, this means as I'm talking to you guys, having your attention on the lecture, taking notes if needed. And when you're talking to a girl, having your attention genuinely on the girl you're speaking to. So whatever you're doing in your day-to-day -day life, that becomes the object of meditation. And then you repeat this process throughout the course of the day or when you're distracted in the meditation. Again, if you go to Bhante Vimala Ramsey, you'll find different explanations. People will go deeper into it. So go there. They explain it a lot better than I can. But the process is you recognize, you release, relax, re-smile, return, and then repeat the process. And this is how you let go of hindrances. Now, this has a very cool side effect. As you let go of hindrances, your reality becomes more and more wholesome. Which changes the way you experience reality in general. So this is almost like a slow wave carrying you towards a more wholesome life. Whereas when we put lenses into reality, it's like an instant fast wave that you would surf over. Not that I know how to surf. But this is like a very soft wave that over time, if you keep doing this again and again and again, and you do the meditation, your reality slowly changes. And you don't realize it until what happened to you happens, right? Until you have an experience one day and you're like, whoa, reality is different, man. And until that point, you'll feel like you're going nowhere. You will doubt doubt will arise but what did i tell you yeah it was that comment about the doubt actually because i was like oh am i doing it right and then you said that oh well that's actually doubt mm -hmm. uh in fact it's like very simple to 6r you right. just kind of do it right. um uh and that doesn't mean it always i was focused on okay so i did it what's the end result how do i feel now right. it's kind of not how it works um and that doubt gets in the way. So once I let go of that, mm -hmm. then I had this understanding of, holy shit, uh, I can approach the world through curiosity and having fun, right. like being a kid in a candy store. Yeah. And then I felt better. Great. So this is how, if you follow this process, over time your reality is going to shift until you see things a few months later and you're like, wow, I would have reacted completely differently to this situation if this was a few months ago. Did you have a question? So for my own keeping everything together, at the beginning of the lecture, we said to create our 2.0 right now, we ask ourselves, what perspective would my higher self look at the world from? And so am I correct in understanding that when we 6R, we're putting ourselves into the perspective that the higher self would look at the world from. Right. And by doing this repeatedly, we slowly make the higher self's perspective our default perspective. Exactly. And then because we've now started changing our internal world, mm -hmm. our external world also starts changing and this combination of internal world plus external world is what we refer to as our reality right. and that starts changing through this through the 6r process yeah a lot of the change comes through that shift over time but this only applies because you guys are already 
you know, doing this type of mentorship. You're already working on your social skills. You're already, you know, trying to eat healthier, get some good sleep, working on becoming a better version of yourself. This doesn't mean someone who watches Netflix every day, they can just sit there for 10 minutes and put like some images in reality and their reality is going to change. The point here is just because you're on this path that most people won't go on, you can accept that the external world will eventually give you what you want it to give you. And you can put the perspective you want to have to the external world because you're already doing the external work. We're not just, you know, meditating eight hours a day and expecting women to just come from the sky and land into the rooftop, although that would be quite cool. We're still taking opportunities when we see them. We're still going to the right places. We're still, you know, saying hello to women that we would want to meet. But through our reality changing, this whole process becomes so much more effortless. And that's why if you do things this way, if you do it in a way where you reduce the craving, where you let go of the hindrances, it's harder to burn out. Because any guy can get results in dating, but one of the biggest issues is guys try for like a month and then they burn out and they give up for six months. And then after six months, they try again. And they try for two months and they give up for a year. But if you can bring in an approach that you can do day in and day out, and that just becomes who you are, there's nothing to burn out from. Because that's just who you are. You can't burn out from who you are. So that's the six R's. Second part of this that's quite important is generosity. So we can be this loving, protective person for the world. So throughout this week, I want you to move through the world with generosity. And that doesn't mean pulling the Nigerian prince routine <laughs> and just giving money to everyone. But this means being generous in the way you interact with strangers, smiling. Being generous in the way you interact with each other. Giving each other the space to speak, truly listening, trying to help each other out. If you see someone who's homeless, who wants some money, you don't just ignore them. You go, hey, sorry, I don't have any cash but enjoy your day. You give them a smile still, no matter who they are. Because generosity doesn't have to be just through money. The best generosity is your energy. So how generous can you be with your energy? And same thing goes with a girl. If you talk to a girl, she's like, oh, sorry, I have a boyfriend. You don't go, ah, what? Boyfriend's drawing, ruined my game again. You go, well, I hope you're happy with your relationship. Enjoy your day. Best of luck. And that's how you leave the conversation. So, generosity is very important because when you move through the world with generosity and with this loving, protective archetype, you will naturally be dominant. If an old lady is trying to cross the street, you're not going to ask the old lady if she needs help. You're going to grab the old lady and carry her across. No, I'm joking. You're going to give her the help she needs. <laughs> and that's very dominant. If you're talking to a girl and she's lost at the bar, she's trying to find her friends, you're not going to say, oh, do you need help? You're going to say, let me help you find your friends. Do you know where they are? Do you have their number? And then you'll, you'll <laughs> carry her to her friends. Remember that, Lloyd? What? <laughs> um, long story. Show me the 
but oh no but when you really when you really take care of people the world takes care of you because the world sees proof over and over and over again if you are given more responsibility you're able to act in a way that's best for the world so you want to move through the world with generosity in terms of how generous you are with your attention and your energy and that can manifest in very simple ways you know if someone's talking and you're a bit bored instead of pulling out your phone six are the craving and genuinely try to listen if let's say you feel like you have an important question but someone's taking 10 minutes on the group call and you're like ah my question's a lot more important <laughs> <laughs> you six are the craving and you become generous <laughs> you become very generous with your energy because that's allowing you to practice generosity but that doesn't mean you don't have boundaries you still have boundaries so if someone's genuinely taking a lot of time you go hey man look what's the what's the question here <laughs> let's get this sorted or if a girl is being rude to you for no reason you don't just stand there and give her metta you're like okay nice to meet you goodbye so you still move through the world with boundaries but it comes with the good energy where even when you set a boundary the tension tightness in your mind is not as much as a regular person would have so that's the second thing that's very important along with the six R's now as you move through the world like we mentioned in the re-smiling steps you want to move through the world with a smile in your eyes smile on your lips smile in your mind and smile in your heart now people will go but I want to be an alpha male and I heard that they don't smile well try this try smiling and see how many people actually take notice see how much of like a vortex you actually become that people just come towards everyone wants to be around positivity and if you can combine positivity with an ability to take risks an ability to truly express and stand by what you believe in then you're not going to have an issue with smiling too much I laugh at everything man like something I might just trip and fall over or the camera falls over as we're recording and I won't get upset I'll be like well that's a bit funny and someone on the dislike button will be like Ege you should have edited this part out man the more you can move through the world with a smile and radiate that energy when you see someone as you're walking you want to send them meta whether that's a grandma or a dog or a girl you want to talk to or an old man or a couple where the guys told the girl you wanted to talk to or that's what comes up in your mind send them meta how amazing it is that they're happy together or <laughs> we had an uber driver yesterday who just drove like he was vin diesel from fast and furious for absolutely no reason <laughs> but you still send meta if you want to say something about the situation in a state of loving kindness feeling that warmth in your heart you can say hey man no rush can we drive a bit slower let's relax and they decide how they want to respond because it's all impersonal but you'll see when you radiate meta the way people respond to you is very different and then you don't need an interesting story you don't need an escalation sequence 
You don't need to assume something. You don't need to ask a certain set of questions. You just have a regular conversation because what pulls them in is not the words you're saying. It's the energy they feel around you. And words come from a place of trying. Words try to push. You always have a verbal response to an obstacle. Energy pulls two different paradigms. So with the right energy, you pull the right people. But that pulling is very natural. You have a question? Understand meta is meta just projecting energy? Or loving kindness. Just it's loving kindness. So for people who are watching who have the same question, if you don't know how to do that, easiest way to start is whatever wishes you give to yourself in the meditation, you give to the other person. So you might say, May you be happy, may you be healthy, may you be taken care of. All those things, just keep it simple. Over time, hola, buenos dias. Over time, you'll get to a place where you'll just have that feeling in your heart, which is good. You asked me that question because I don't, it, it just happens. Right. So in my morning meditations, I'm doing exactly, as you said, mine, I, to myself and then to my spiritual friend. When I give those three kind, uh, wholesome wishes, that's actually meta. Yeah. And I'm practicing giving meta. Well, meta is the loving kindness to feel. It's like oh. after giving those, you're trying to logically understand this, which you want to be able. Okay, because I don't understand it yet, but I'm following the practice. You don't need to understand. Okay. You need to feel it. Okay. And you'll feel it. Like, you know, when you think of your cat, what do you feel? Do you logically understand that feeling? No. But you feel it. Yeah, I feel like a warm sense of comfort. Exactly. That's meta. That's meta? Oh, okay. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, that's the third thing that's important. Moving through the world, radiating meta, and genuinely having that good intent. Last part of this is the content you see, no matter how careful you are, affects the beliefs you build. So examine the um, things you watch. Examine the people you're around. Examine your Instagram feed. Examine your personal Facebook feed. And... When you go to your YouTube recommended section and there's a video with like an attractive girl and a, and like a dramatic title like <laughs> someone kicks out a girl from their podcast or something. <laughs> and you, you feel this craving to click and see the drama, you let go of that craving. Because no matter how much like ah, yeah, dopamine hit you might feel in the moment, you're going to pay for watching that content later on. So when I wake up these days, I check some messages maybe, and then I put on a Dhamma talk. I go to Bhantavid Miller Ramsey, open up a talk. As I wake up, I listen to that. Um, and then I do some like stretching movements and stuff. And it goes for music as well. Like if you listen to very heavy rap, it might be good to put you into a bit of a swag state, but over some time, you'll actually see how much craving that creates. And this is why in the, in the retreats, they have the precepts that you go by. And I've already told you guys, but I'm trying not to swear. Because when you swear, it creates tension and tightness in the mind. And for a long time, trust me, I was like, ah, oh, it's no big deal. And English is not my first language, so it doesn't sound bad to me. But it wasn't until I let go of that that I realized how much peaceful and calm the mind can become. So 
when you examine the content you watch and the reality you live in and you have this strong like strong big boundary higher level boundary around your life you can be very very nice very very kind very very compassionate very very loving but people won't mess around with you because they know if you bring in the negative energy you're out and you don't get second chances so you don't need to be this bad boy trying to assert boundaries all the time you just create get very clear on the reality you want to live in and what's going to be allowed in that reality and you say no to everything else and within that reality you can be extremely loving and kind and giving to people but no one will take advantage of you and if they try to they will be out in 10 seconds any questions one second So, for those of us who, and I'm going to extrapolate content here to not just digital content we consume, but people we, be or we have to be around. And we all know the case of sometimes we just have co-workers who are the type who want to complain about everything and just sometimes you don't have a choice but to be around people who want to be unhappy right. and so when removal is not an option mm -hmm. what are other measures we can take in order to prevent these negative influences from impacting our own beliefs yeah so as you six are your state's going to be a lot more solid so it won't affect you as much but the best thing you can do when you first start building this is to remove the people as much as you can and if that is not possible you limit the time you spend around them as much as you can and if people go on a cycle of complaining a lot of the time that's just their default response so you can say hey man you know I'd love to talk to you I don't want to be talking about complaining or you know all of this type of stuff but what's something interesting you did over the weekend so you can guide the conversation into the direction that you want the conversation go and you will see it's again it's all impersonal people don't want to be complaining complaining is just their default reality so by shifting their attention to somewhere else you can shift how they speak and what they speak about and what they do and how they move through the world but for you to be able to do that first is the meditation in the six R's so that the place you're in becomes very very strong and at the same time another important thing is you don't want to feed that conversation so if they're complaining don't feel like you're being rude if you're not adding anything you can still listen and give meta yeah okay and eventually they'll be like what about you but don't be the person who's like yeah man that's terrible you know blah 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 you don't have to add anything and you might see that sometimes I do that like some someone might be like oh I had this amazing day but yeah very cool because they just want that to let that out there and people think it's empathetic that if someone's complaining you like dig deeper well it's not good for you so I don't it's their problem to fix, not mine. And I'm saying this as someone who does coaching. So as someone who's doing a bit of coaching as well, even with clients, 
you can dive into what they're complaining about to extract the real problem. But if someone's just complaining to complain, I don't feed nutriment to the hindrance. I'm like, okay. Right, so there are no girls to meet in your area. All right. What's that I lonely single thing you <laughs> Yeah, it's a classic. They always have to be moms, though. Yeah. Does that make sense? Any other questions? That's it for the lecture. You would mention the meta. You would mention the meta bubble. Yeah. Okay. Are you willing to give a quick overview, or is that for another time? That's a bit more if you get deeper into the meta. Got it. Like most people would be more confused than anything. Cool. Any other questions? No questions. Not a question, but more of a comment. Uh, it's a cool realization I had when you were talking about how people don't want to be in these hindrances. Genuinely, even if they haven't meditated, if you were to get inside their mind, they don't want to be feeling doubt, hatred, sensual desire. Well, maybe not sensual desire. Mm -hmm. Right, but the attachment when they want it, they don't want to be feeling that. Right. I had a cool thought about that, which I'll tell you later. It's not relevant to this, but... Yeah, once you realize it's all impersonal, it becomes much easier to feel compassion to people. Because someone who might think, oh, coaching is a scam, I will never buy anything from any coach, <laughs> it's all impersonal. That's just what they believe. Mm -hmm. But if I take that personally and I go, oh, this person doesn't believe what I teach, then here's the funny thing. You create more suffering for yourself. They don't care. So when you realize the impersonal nature of how everyone acts and how every reaction is impersonal in its nature, because when you meditate, you get into direct experiences where you see the links of how things originate. And everyone's mind works the same way. So if it's impersonal for you, if after you've slept for four hours and you haven't eaten anything and the coffee stores are closed and you go out on the street, you're a lot more irritable than compared to if you slept eight, nine hours, did your workout, had a breakfast. Then, of course, it's going to be the same thing for anyone else. So when you walk up to a girl and you give her a genuine compliment and she gives a very unusual reaction... It's probably very impersonal. I mean, for you guys, it's definitely impersonal. For some people, if that keeps happening, you know, reach out, get the help you need. If it's a pattern, there's something you can do. But if it's a one-off situation, that's their work to do. And people don't want to be in those states just like you don't want to be in a state of doubt, ill will and hatred, extreme sensual desire, restlessness, or sloth and torpor. Other people don't want to be in those states either. So if you look at the higher version of you in that way, you can, over time, as you become very adept at doing this for yourself you can shift the way other people feel so a conversation you have with a girl might genuinely change her life and that's a lot of cool skills and cool things that you can play with but first you need to prove a track record that if you are given these tools you are given these skills that you use it for the best of the world and for the best of who you want to be and what you can contribute any other questions it would be <coughs> it would be beneficial to people watching because you explain what things not being impersonal You've explained that to me in greater detail before mm -hmm. from the causes and conditions standpoint. Right. So 
I think if you give a quick one minute ex- explanation of what you mean when you say that things are not impersonal, that's going to be helpful for people watching. Yeah, the detailed version is pretty detailed, but a quick experiment is like, you know, the easiest thing is, hey, don't think of a pink elephant. What are you thinking of? A pink elephant. So do you have any control over where your thoughts come from? No, because when you try to control them, it didn't work. So therefore, every thought that arises, it's just like something you see. You're not a part of X-Men where you decide what you see. Where you're like, when I look at Lloyd, I want to see... I don't know. I want to see Megan Fox. Doesn't work that way. Exactly. It's like... Thinking is also another sense door and thoughts just arise. They're not your thoughts. They're just thoughts that arise. The only way you have actual somewhat control over your thoughts is by 6 Ring. Naturally, your mind generates more wholesome thoughts. And that's what shifts your reality and your dating life. And a lot more than your dating life, but... Let's start with your dating life first. Anything else? Cool. This is lecture one. For those of you watching on YouTube, hopefully our two viewers are still here. Drop a comment if you enjoyed it. For you guys, we're going to head to the mall probably. Do a bit of approaching, see what's going on. But that's it for today.